Hello. We will now continue with um, some more practical issues. We ended up uh, the previous presentation by um, explaining that some of the metrics elements were calculated in a real space grid of uniform points. That means that um, the integrals and, the, and therefore the total energy will depend somewhat on the position of the basis orbitals relative to the grid points. And this is called the egg box effect because um, it creates mm, a fictitious potential uh, with the say, shape of an egg box um, depending on the position of the atoms. Uh, to um, ameliorate that, um, Siesta allows to perform what we call grid cell sampling by uh, calculating the matrix elements at different positions of the atoms relative to the grid points. An important factor of um, accuracy in Siesta is the fineness of the grid used to um, integrate the matrix elements. And we measure this finer fineness by the uh, um, maximum uh, energy of a plane wave that can be represented in uh, that grid, and which is given by this simple formula is a function of the grid spacing. However, it is important to understand that uh, the mesh cutoff used in siesta uh, is different from the plane wave cutoff of a plane wave basis. In the later, uh, increasing the um, cutoff of the plane waves increases the number of plane waves and always leads to a decrease in energy. Uh, in siesta, increasing the mesh cutoff of the integration grid can either increase or decrease the energy. So the convergence is not always from both. Another important issue is k-point sampling which means nothing but integrating in reciprocal space. In a solid, the wave functions are characterized by a plane wave vector uh, k, um, which characterizes the block functions. And we need to integrate over the Brillouin zone um, what in practice is done uh, in a um, grid of uniformly uh, uh, separated points is in, real, is in real space. Because of symmetry, uh, some points are equivalent and uh, we need to integrate only over the um, f mm, irreducible part of the brilliant zone, which is here shown by the blue points. Mohors and Pak uh, notice that if you displace the grid points relative to the origin, uh, the degeneracy of the points uh, increases and you need fewer points in the irreducible part. In any case, the accuracy of this integration is characterized by the fineness of the grid, as in real space, and uh, so by the separation between the grid points. So we do something similar as in real space and we characterize the, the fineness of the, grids, of the grid by um, vector in reciprocal of reciprocal space that is in real space uh, given by this relationship is a function of the uh, mesh separation and we call it the length cutoff uh, by increasing the length cutoff you increase the number of grid points and uh, the accuracy of the integration we have already explained that some metric elements involve the integral of, of a potential over the overlap region between pairs of basis orbitals. If the system is finite, there will be only one such overlap region between two basis orbitals. However, if the system is periodic, there will be repetitions of the basis orbitals in each, in each unit cell, and there will be different regions of overlap between uh, 
pairs of basis orbitals, in this case the orange one and the red one. If uh, only the so-called gamma point, so if k equals zero, uh, is involved, then the phase of the wave function in different repetitions of the unit cell will be the same, and we can simply add the integral over the different overlap regions. However, if uh, we are performing k-point sampling, uh, the phase factor at the different uh, unit cells will be different, and uh, the different overlaps will have to be multiplied by different uh, phase factors. That means that we need to keep track of different overlaps between the same pair of basis orbitals uh, corresponding to different repetitions of the unit cell to be multiplied by different phase factors for different k vectors. What Siesta does is to increase the unit cell into a larger supercell and to repeat the basis orbitals as if they were different uh, in the whole supercell. And it calculates the overlaps between the different repetitions of the basis orbitals. Um, this supercell is in principle transparent to the user, but it is all the time um, working uh, inside uh, the program. We have already explained that Siesta uh, assumes that the system uh, is periodically repeated, that is, periodic boundary conditions. This is true even for systems that are not really periodic, like molecules. And it allows to solve Poisson's equation, that is, to find the potential, the electrostatic potential from the density using fast Fourier transforms. What one does is you Fourier transform the density, and then the Fourier coefficients of the potential are related to those of the density by this simple relationship, and then you Fourier transform back to real space. This uh, has um, some consequences. Uh, first, if the um, total charge is not zero, that is, if the system is charged, then um, um, the Fourier coefficient for g equals zero is not zero, and uh, Vg becomes infinite. What, what is simply reflects that the potential will be infinite for an infinite repetition of charges. So what Siesta does in that case is to compensate the net charge by a uniform background of compensating charge. The second consequence is that if you have mm, dipoles or, or of course net charges in the, in the system, then this will induce um, a spurious interaction between different images of the charge in different unit cells. So you have to take this into account um, in the case of uh, systems with charge or dipoles. Another issue worth mentioning is how Siesta calculates the exchange and correlation potential. In uh, DFT, the exchange and correlation potential is the functional derivative of the exchange correlation energy, which in uh, the GGA approximation depends on the local charge and the gradient of the local charge. When one performs this functional derivative, the results depends not only on the density and its gradient, but on higher order derivatives, and it is a rather complicated uh, expression. So, what SISTA does is to calculate the gradient um, as, uh, using finite derivatives from the density itself, using some higher order derivatives, but let us simplify it with, with a first order derivative with this formula, and then once you have calculated the gradient using the density at the grid points, you will have the expression for the exchange correlation energy as an integral over the grid points, and therefore as a function of the density at the different points. 
That means that the expression of the exchange correlation energy will be a, a, a normal function of the density at all points rather than uh, functional. And that the exchange per correlation potential can be calculated as a normal partial derivative of the energy at the different points with respect to each particular uh, density at each point. Since, as explained previously, the energy is a complicated expression with many terms depending on many matrix elements, uh, the forces and stresses, which are the derivatives of the energy with respect to the atomic positions or the formations of the unit cell, uh, also have many terms. Um, in siesta, uh, the philosophy is that each time you calculate a matrix element or a term that depends on the, uh, that, that uh, is in the energy, you also calculate the, uh, its derivative with respect to the uh, atomic positions and the formation vectors. For example, uh, a matrix element of a potential V between two pairs of basis orbitals uh, can be written in this way. Uh, and because um, the phi orbital is a function of R minus R V, this uh, can be rewritten as a matrix element between uh, the basis orbital and the gradient of uh, another basis orbital. Um, this is important, or this contributes also to the forces because uh, when you move an atom, you also move the basis orbitals of that atom. And this um, uh, contains some terms in the forces which are called Poulet forces. And in, in Siesta they are calculated with the rest of, uh, of terms and included automatically in the forces and, and stresses. Of course, all this uh, can be done only in the last self-consistency iterations, that is when you have already converged the density. Also regarding the stress, or in particular the pressure, that is the derivative of the energy with respect to the volume, uh, Siesta prints two pressures, which are called solid pressure and molecule pressure. This refers to two possible definitions of pressure, that is of the derivative of the energy with respect to volume. If you increase the volume of the unit cell, you could do two different with, uh, things with the atoms. In a solid, what you, what you would expect is that the atoms or the interatomic distances increase um, with the um, volume of the unit cell so that the, the, the relative shape remains um, the same. In a molecule, however, you would expect that as you increase the volume of the unit cell, the molecule, the molecule does not expand but remains, the distances remain the same. This doesn't mean that the uh, pressure is zero because there may still be some interaction between molecules in two different repetitions of the unit cell, but of course mm, you would expect the pressure to be much less that, than if you expand the molecule with the unit cell. And let, a, let us finish with something which is frequently the nightmare of the DFT practitioner which is the self-consistency convergence. We have already seen that uh, we have to perform a self-consistency cycle in which you uh, start with some density, you calculate a potential, and from that potential you solve Schrodinger's equation, and you calculate uh, a new density. Uh, and you have to um, iterate this until the final density, or the new density, is equal to the Initial, uh, to the input density. In practice, what happens is that this simple cycle does not converge, so that the density um, gets wild. So uh, a simple procedure is to, uh, in the new iteration, to start not with the new density, but with a mixing of the old density and the new density. And uh, the weight of the new density is referred to as the mixing weight. And typically it 
it has to be only a few percent for the uh, cycle to converge. Um, the reason or the main reason for the divergence of the self-consistency cycle is um, the phenomenon of charge sloshing. If you have, let's say, a system composed of two subsystems um, and most of the charge is, let's say, in the, in the, in the system one, so that the density here is large and the density here is small, then uh, because of Coulomb repulsion, the um, energy of the states in this system will be larger than those in this system. So um, the um, energy uh, scheme will be like this. If the Fermi energy happens to be in between the two states, uh, uh, this state will become charged because it is below the Fermi level and this will become empty. And then in the next iteration, the charge will go from here to here and will be like that. And, uh, and of course, this will, in the next iteration, uh, repeat and, and, and you will get a divergence of, of this process instead of convergence. One simple way of moderating this is to increase the electronic temperature. So not to fill the states strictly um, if they are above or below the Fermi level, but to, to weight the, them with, uh, with um, Fermi Dirac um, weight so that both of them will be partially occupied. Another way of um, facilitating the convergence of the self-consistency cycle is to use a more sophisticated um, mixing scheme. And what we typically use is uh, the so-called called Poulet mixing. If you have um, some input-density at the nth step of the cycle and the output is rho nu, uh, we can define the difference between the output and input densities as uh, the residual um, difference. Now, what you would like is that the residual would be zero because then the output and input densities would be equal and, and you would be finished. So what you can do is to uh, generate a new density for the next step, which is um, a combination of m previous densities. Um, and you do this by minimizing the size of the expected residuals, where you expect that the expected residual will also be the same combination uh, of the uh, previous residuals. So you choose this coefficient, C, uh, this coefficient CK to minimize the residual of the next iteration and you input them uh, in the, uh, new, the new density. If you do strictly this, then you will not really evolve because your density will typically be stuck in the same set of previous, uh, previous densities. So you have to somehow also mix it with some part of the output densities and not only of the input densities as written here. So you will also have a mixing weight for the output part of the densities. Okay, and with this, um, we finish this uh, second presentation, and uh, I wish you a, a nice rest of the of the course. Thank you.